leftist writer, modern writer, and uh, he touches on some very helpful things, I think, about the doctrine of scripture, which is, of course, always there in the background when you and I pick up the scriptures, and he puts it well. And also, I put there a brief outline of the passage we're looking at this morning to give you a bit of a hopefully understanding of the flow of the passage, but that's pretty self-explanatory. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, once again, we come to sit under the authority of your word. Pray you would teach those who need teaching, encourage those who need encouraging, rebuke and correct those who need rebuking and correcting, that we might do all for your glory through Jesus our Lord. Amen. There's various passages in the scriptures that are hard to interpret and understand. And, and even after 2,000 years since the end of the New Testament, uh, Christians can't quite work that out what a passage means. One of those difficult passages, for instance, is in Genesis 6, where it says the angels came and intermarried with the uh, or the sons of God came and intermarried with the sons of men. And they're the most godliest Christians uh, are not agreed on exactly uh, the interpretation of that passage. And when you read someone that has the definitive answer, alarm bells should go off in your head because uh, it's a difficult passage of scripture. Um, and uh, the outcomes of it are clear, but it's not an easy passage to understand. Other passages of scripture are relatively easy to understand, but they're often applied wrongly. And you get that as we come to this passage this morning. If there's a, a verse in scripture that's been misapplied in all sorts of wrong ways, it's verse, the first part of book, verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And, uh, and in some ways that dominates this passage. That's a a negative command, of course, it's not a suggestion, it's an imperative. Remember the New Testament particularly, that or the letters of Paul and the other epistles are written in this language of indicatives and imperatives. And uh, children, if you don't know the difference, get mum or dad to explain you. This is an imperative, it's a negative one because it's got the no in it. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And it's been the subject of all sorts of um, faulty misapplications uh, at times in the history of the church. Um, we'll come back to that. But, but uh, what, what's in here is important is, is you could, and Paul expands on that with these um, five comments. And, and of course, there's a sermon there. Uh, really, this passage falls into the three sections I've put up into the screen. And all three of those sections deserve a sermon by themselves. Uh, a, a proper explanation of the negative command uh, needs teasing out these five uh, things that he says as this part of this do not be yoked together um, uh, ex need expanding and we're going to do that quickly should be a whole sermon then of course there's the positive affirmation and again the great promises there probably need more than one sermon to tease them out and then the summary that's given at the start of chapter 7, the, obviously the chapter division's in the wrong place. We don't believe the chapter divisions in the verses uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were put in at the time of the Reformation with the, with the establishing of the printing press, or particularly the verses were. And sometimes the people that divided it up put them basically in the wrong place. You are God's holy dwelling place. So I want us particularly to think about the phrase that comes there in uh, verse 16, for we are the temple of the living God. Uh, that this is the great gospel in a nutshell. This is the glory of God living with man, living in your life. And it's all summed up in this gospel in a nutshell. Uh, but before we get to that, we need to look at this warning. There's a covenantal warning here, a warning to those who belong to the new covenant that they are to uh, deal properly uh, and you have to deal with it. You can't avoid it. We're not ostriches putting our head in the sand. Deal 
wisely and properly with those who were still strangers to the covenant. Now, remember back in chapter two, uh, Paul has been talking in the opening two chapters about uh, his struggles and battles in, in his missionary work. And he's got to the end of verse 13 of chapter two and he says, so I said goodbye to them and I went on to Macedonia. And then he cuts that off and he goes into this long explanation of the new covenant that actually finishes when we get to chapter seven and verse four. And in verse five, you'll notice he says, for when we came into Macedonia, he, so it's the word Macedonia there that makes that link. And everything that we've been looking at over the last few weeks, dare I say it, months, uh, has to do with his explanation of the gospel. He's gone into this excursus. This is typical of, of how Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, writes many of his letters. And this wonderful excursus is built around the new covenant. And remember way back in chapter 3, we're told, in verse 3, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the heart. Carl preached on us so well from that passage in, in chapter 3 about the new covenant and the old covenant. And so here we are, and what Paul is dealing with here is the relationship between new covenant, between believers who are now new covenant believers and old covenant believers or non-believers, particularly in the context of 2 Corinthians, when he writes here in verse 1, uh, four, sorry, verse 14, but do not be yoked together with unbelievers. He's thinking again of the false teachers. The false teachers, he's saying, are unbelievers. Why are they unbelievers? Because in the Jewish context, in the covenant context, they're holding on to Moses. For them, Moses is still preeminent. They haven't understood that it's all about Christ. Moses was wonderful in his day. Moses is important in his day. But Moses points to Christ. And now that Christ has come, you can leave Moses behind, as it were. And that's, of course, the point the writer makes in Hebrews chapter 3. Moses is a servant in the house. Christ is the son over the house. And so Paul is saying that if the Corinthians go back to believe the false teachers and link themselves with the false teachers, they're being unequally yoked. Now, this verse has been wrongly applied, as I said before, in so many ways. It's important to note, based, and it's based on two passages in the Old Testament, but particularly Deuteronomy 22.9, that the, the inequality that's talked about here is not inequality in the sense of yoking a big, strong old oxen with a brand new, may say, well, or untrained oxen, or, or putting a big horse with a little horse, because they're the same. A horse is a horse and an oxen's an oxen. What's being said here is it's not inequality between the same kind, but different kinds. In the Deuteronomy passage, they weren't allowed to sow two different crops together. They weren't allowed to wear garments in Leviticus that were a mixture of fibers. And so the point here is do not be unequally yoked. Do not be yoked to someone else who is different from you. And that's the point of the false teachers. The false teachers are still yoked to Moses. As believers, the Corinthian church and you and I, we're yoked to Christ. And you can't yoke to Christ and at the same time yoke yourself to Moses. Or you could say, to put it in a, a more modern context, you can't yoke yourself to Christ and yoke yourself to Buddha and yoke yourself to Muhammad, Christ and the millions of Hindu gods, the Christ and the Krishna gods, the, uh, the inequality that is the point here is difference. Now, this verse has been wrongly applied. You know, it's been applied to say that um, uh, a white Christian shouldn't marry a black African Christian. Uh, that, you know, a person who's a Christian or, or from a certain social standing shouldn't marry someone beneath them. And, and all this sort of nonsense. None of that's applicable here. I'm not saying there's not 
Uh, there's not a drawing out here when it comes to marriage, but the simple point is that if you're a Christian, you don't get yoked in marriage to a non-Christian. If that other person you want to be yoked to is a Christian and they're pink, blue, or green, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the fact is they have to be Christian. Yoke yourself as a Christian to other Christians. And that's also true, as Paul points out here, in uh, this wider context. Now, again, if you uh, read the notes, you'll, you'll, you'll find, of course, Paul is saying that you can't go out of the world. He's not making a case here for withdrawing, becoming, you know, a little clan of Christians in the outback somewhere and having nothing to do with the world. The very opposite. As you read the scriptures, Christ and his servants roll up their sleeves and they get stuck into the world because it's God's world and they've come to bring the good news of the gospel to that world. So what Paul does, and he's particularly applying this, remember, to the false teachers, he gives these five questions. For what do righteousness and wickedness have and have a common fellowship? Can, what can fellowship and light have with darkness? He spells out five of them. And everyone anticipates the answer, no, none. It's crystal clear. That's why the command is given. So you take the command and you apply it to each of these situations. And the answer is no, 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 no. Five resounding no's, particularly aimed at the false teachers, but applicable in many ways in our modern age to uh, broader situations. He's not saying you can't work for a non-Christian boss. You have to remember many in the early church, not all, but many were slaves and, and they had pagan bosses. And Paul never says, the scriptures never say, rebel against your pagan slave master and flee. And the very opposite, the scriptures say, be obedient to them, even though they're pagan. So all those sort of arguments that are thrown up in the history of the church are garbage. You must understand the context that Paul's dealing with here. There's a covenantal warning. If you're going to be a member of the new covenant, if you're going to live for Christ, and remember God's written his law on your heart, make sure you don't unequally yoke yourself to those who are wrong who are doctrinally rejecting Christ. We're not saying here that, you know, Baptists and Presbyterians can't get on. We might have some differences, but that's not the issue. The, the issue is not uh, on those peripheral things. This is the heart of the gospel. Having said that, Paul then goes on to uh, make these great comments that affirm the glory and majesty of the new covenant and of Christ. He puts the question, for what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? And of course, sadly, that's the history of much of the Old Testament. Here at home, we're reading through uh, the Old Testament, it's family devotions. And we've just got to uh, Elijah and Mount Carmel. And what does Elijah do after Mount Carmel? He takes the 450 prophets of uh, Baal and he kills them. Uh, and, and that's an apt illustration, not, not that we're wanting to practice that sort of thing. It was appropriate in Elijah's day, not our own necessarily, but the point's crystal clear, isn't it? And in this covenant of affirmation, the heart of it really is the, the bit that comes after the last question, for we are the temple of the living God. You are a holy place. What is a temple? Well, in any religion, it's the holy dwelling place, or at least maybe not at all religions a holy one, but a, the dwelling place of the God. And in the Old Testament, that God is a holy God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, as Isaiah sees him in the temple. And it's the dwelling place of God. And the Greek word that's used here refers particularly to the holy of holies within the temple. And so when the apostle says under the Holy Spirit, we're the temple of the living God, he's saying that the very holy God, whose glory cloud, you read in, we read in, in Leviticus 16, dwells there in the holy of holies above the atonement cover. And in other parts of the scripture, heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. It's as if the Lord's feet 
sit there in the Holy of Holies so that when the high priest coming in, he's worshiping at the foot of the living God, that God dwells in you. That Holy of Holies in the temple is you. And that's a point Paul's made in 1 Corinthians twice. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, he says, you are the temple of the living God. And, and the you there is, probably, is plural, I think, and it's talking about the church. This applies to us as a church. We are the dwelling place of the eternal God who's written his law on your hearts. But then in 1 Corinthians 6, you remember when he's talking about sin and sexual sin in particular, he applies it individually. And he says, particularly to the men, you're a dwelling place of a holy God. So don't take your, your holy body, which is now holy to God because God dwells in it and united in immoral sexual practices with, with the, the uh, pagan prostitution that was, was part of Corinthian worship at their, at their temples. You are a holy God. And, uh, and this is the transforming dynamic of the gospel. And this is what sets Paul as a preacher of the new covenant over against the false teachers of the old covenant. They're still preaching Moses. And remember, under Moses, yes, the Holy of Holies is there and the tabernacle, as we read in Leviticus 16, and the Holy of Holies is there when Solomon builds the temple later on. But only the high priest could go into that Holy of Holies. And he could only go once a year. And let me read to you again the words Carl read, because these are the, in some ways, the important words at the start of that uh, passage in Leviticus 16. Let me refer you to Leviticus 16, verse 2. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain. You see, Aaron can't just say, oh, gee, I'm having a great day today. You know, I'm feeling great. I'll just charge into the temple and bowl into the presence of God. It's not of his choosing. Remember the structure of the temple when Solomon built it. You had the temple. Outside, you had the different courtyards and, and say, the at the time of Jesus when Herod rebuilt the temple. You had the furthest away was the Gentiles. So us Gentiles could go to, into the Gentile court, but that was the, the outer court. That was like the parking ground around the MCG. You couldn't get into it. And then the Jewish women could go a bit closer. They could go into the court of the women. But then into the actual uh, uh, perimeter, you might say, of the, of the temple, only the men could go where the great sea was and, and the animals were killed. And then into the temple itself, of course, even Jewish men couldn't go, only the priests. But as the priests went in there day after day and they trimmed the candles and they replaced the showbread, they'd look at that curtain and how they must have been tempted to step through that curtain. But not even the high priest, not even Aaron, not even the high priest at the time of Jesus could choose himself just to walk in there only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And, and so you think of that for a moment. Think of the, the hundreds of thousands, millions of men in ancient Israel from the time of Moses and Aaron to the coming of Christ who never got inside the temple because most of them weren't priests. And of the select few who got inside the temple, only one, usually high priest, 20, 30, 40 years, could go behind that curtain. And only on that day, he couldn't choose it. Now you are the dwelling place of the living God. God himself dwells in these frail, mortal, weak bodies. You have access, as Hebrews says, to the throne of grace. You're a holy place yourself. This is the dynamic of the gospel. This is what Christ has done. He's not only opened up the curtain, but he's come and by the spirit, he dwells in your body and he dwells in our midst as 
a church. This is the gospel. And this is why anything that detracts from Christ, such as the false preachers were doing, or any modern religion that says, well, yes, we believe in Jesus, but we also believe in X, Y, Z, is to be avoided like the plague. Paul then goes on, and as he's given these negative things under do not be unequally yoked, he puts these positive things, you might say, and he does so, of course, by quoting from the scriptures. I will live with them and walk with them, and that I will be their God and they will be my people. You see that the great promises here, the great I wills of God, God himself is speaking, as God has said, I will, I will, I will. And of course, the great wonder of this is it's, it's not just that God will do these things for the nation of Israel, but he's expanded these things so that he walks and lives with us Gentiles. And now we are the true Israel. The church in that sense has the place, uh, become the place of God's great dwelling. There's this great blessing then, isn't it? And, and again, really, if time were, were with us, we could take time to look at each of these phrases. I will live with them. The, the presence of God living in your life, living in your family, living with us as a church. God walking with us. Uh, this idea of walking is, is more than just what we think of. In, in the Bible, Often walking has to do with authority and possession. Uh, when Abraham first came into the promised land, uh, God told him to walk the length of the promised land. And that wasn't just because Abraham was obese and needed a bit of exercise because he, he, he was a bit tubby, but that walking was a sign of his future possession and ownership of the land on behalf of God. And when God promises to walk with his church, it's a sign that he owns the church and he's in the church and he's controlling the church. And of course, that we will be the people of God, something that was foreign, particularly to us Gentiles in the old covenant. And then of course, it expands even more on this in verse 18, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's this, whole sermon there isn't it on the doctrine of adoption and what it means for god to be our father the restoration of eden you remember in luke uh, when luke gives the genealogy of christ he works all the way back to adam and he finishes that genealogy by saying adam the son of god because adam was created by god and and you see, in that sense, without any pagan notions or, or, or anything coming in, if you did, please don't misunderstand me, he's the offspring of God because God is his creator and his sustainer. And in that sense, God has become your father. Here is great family privilege and great family blessing. Now, remember, when we use the word father, you've got to remember that we're using it uh, analogically, that in Language, again, we come to these three uses of words. You have univocal, you have equivocal, and you have analogical. And we're using it analogically. We're not using the word univocally. We're not using the word equi equivocally. We're using it analogically. But what a blessing. For some of you, you might think of your own father, and you might have negative thoughts. Maybe you had a hard childhood. Maybe some of you grew up in, in homes where there was an absent father, either removed by death or removed by sin of, of some sort. Um, and not all of us necessarily have pleasant, thankfully many do, but not all of us have pleasant memories uh, of fathers. Uh, I could tell you stories that would, that would make you weep. You know, uh, let me just give you one glimpse in, in the late sixties in Dunedin in New Zealand, not far from where Carl grew up, a young 12 year old girl was uh, listening to uh, an open air service, uh, the preaching of the gospel. And she uh, never seen a Bible, never heard the gospel. And she responded and the evangelist led her to Christ and gave her a Bible. 
And she went home all excited and she told her dad and her dad took the Bible, tore it up and said, you'll not be a Christian. You will be a prostitute like your other three sisters. And what sort of father is that? And, and you know, God is not that sort of father. So there's the great privilege and the great blessing of, uh, of belonging to Christ and, and all that the scriptures have to say here. How do you respond to all of this? Well, Paul makes that clear in verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Notice here Paul includes himself. He, he uses the we. He doesn't resort to I. He doesn't resort to you. He says we. We are in this together. I'm the same as you, he's saying. Pastor and people are the same here. What do we have? We have the promises of God. We have the new covenant promises of God. We have the fulfillment of the promise from Genesis chapter 3 that the crusher would come, defeat the evil one, and usher in the gospel. And all that's been fulfilled. These promises, what are these promises? Well, they, they lead us to action. Don't they? That's what Paul's saying here. He says, he, he says, you have these promises, understand them, understand the reality of what you've got in Christ, and then behave like it. These promises lead to action. That is the word in faith. What you have is the word of God. You believe that word, and then you act accordingly. What does Romans say? Faith comes how? Faith comes by hearing. You hear the word. Of course, unfaith is a wrong response to hearing, isn't it? Disbelief. Uh, the two people can hear the gospel preached. And one responds in faith and the other responds in rejection. Unfaith, disbelief. Eve had the word of God in the garden, but she responded in rebellion and disbelief. So just having the word, just hearing the word isn't an automatic thing that you then automatically have faith. You have to exercise that faith. You have to believe the word. You have to act on it. And Paul says having these promises and acting on them means doing certain things. He puts it negatively. He says, let us purify ourselves from everything. Don't do those things that contaminate the body and the spirit. There are certain things that are damaging to your body. We're praying for Keith and, and we're thankful for God's grace in his life. But Keith is suffering from sins and mistakes brought about in some ways by his past sin. And, and you see the reality of that in our society all the, all the time. You see the problems that come. And there's interesting, isn't it, that the, the Holy Spirit here through Paul says, contaminates body and spirit there's this link between body and spirit you dabble in drugs uh you'll not only damage your body but you'll damage your mind and your soul uh, and so there's this link you mustn't forget that so so what you do with your body is important and, and what you do with your spirit is important and the two are interconnected here there's some things you don't do and that's clear and made clear in other parts of scripture. The positive side is there, isn't it? We have these promises. So what do we do? You purify yourself. You make yourself holy. Pur purification is just another way of talking about holiness. The holy God is living in your body now by the power of the spirit. Therefore, you live a purified life. And that purified life comes in different actions, of course, uh, but it particularly comes out through the tongue, as Jesus said, out of the heart of the issues of life. And what's in your heart often comes out through your mouth. If you're angry in your heart, you'll be angry in your tongue. If you're bitter in your heart, you'll be bitter in your tongue. If you're greedy in your heart, you'll be greedy in your tongue. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We do this, we perfect holiness out of or in reverence for God. So there's some things you don't do. He doesn't amplify this list here. 
uh, of course, there's many places in Scripture that do that for you. There's something you must do, and that must is you seek to be holy. That is, you seek to let the Holy Spirit in you work himself out in your eyes and your ears and your hands and your feet and your tongue. Perfecting holiness. Remember what the scriptures say in Hebrews. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Why, does the script, why do the scriptures say that? Well, if you don't perfect holiness, it's because you're not holy inside. And you're not holy inside because you haven't been washed in the blood and the Holy Spirit is not living in you. He's not talking about salvation by works. He's talking about internal change that manifests itself in external behavior and out of reverence for God. If you have a low view of God, you'll have a low view of holiness and you'll have a low view of how you live your life. And you'll have a low view of the sin in the society round about us and you won't see the need to keep yourself set apart from it. Again, remember, I'm not saying withdraw, I'm not saying become a, a monk or a nun or anything like that, but it's in the midst of the filth of the pigsty of this world that you and I are called to holiness and to worship of the living God. You really are, if you know Christ this morning, God's holy dwelling place. If you don't know Christ, you can't, you can't attain to these things by pulling up your bootstraps or putting on different clothes. You must flee to the cross and you must come to know Christ. As I finish, it's obvious that in one sense, you and I are conscious we fall short of this, that there's still areas in all of our lives and in our church together where we need to be purified, where we need to grow in holiness. We need deeper understanding of the majesty and glory and awe of God. So when you're conscious of your failings, go to the cross. What makes you holy? It's the blood of Christ. Until you're washed in the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit can never dwell within you and when you fail when you grieve the spirit you wash yourself afresh in the blood of the lamb let us pray father we thank you that you have made unbelievably amazing promises lord our, it, it's our problem we don't really grip the reality of those promises that all those promises as second corinthians has already told us are Yea, and amen in Christ, that we have no access to the promises of God outside of Christ. But when we grasp Christ and understand those promises, we live in heaven. We work it out on earth and we look forward to heaven where there will be no sin and where the promises of faith will be replaced by sight. And we thank you again for the blood of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.